Hello everyone, how you doing? I'm Chris. Don't mind that, it's just a piece of candy. So, this is another free history. This is about James Armistead Lafayette, the double agent of the American Revolution. I know the name. But I'm not exactly sure what he did. So let's find out. The combined Franco-American victory at the Battle of Yorktown on October 19, 1781 effectively guaranteed American independence after the surrender of Lord Cornwallis and some 7,500 British and German soldiers the British government sought a negotiated settlement to end the war. There would be no more major battles. The battle is often praised as George Washington's greatest achievement. His decisive and daring decision to march his army to Yorktown was a bold gambit that ultimately secured America's freedom from British tyranny. Or that's the story, or rather the myth, we are told. While Washington certainly skillfully took advantage of events, he couldn't have done so if he didn't know what was happening. As any military commander knows, knowledge is power. In July 1781, the Comte de Rochambeau, the commander of all French forces in North America, met with Washington to discuss coming operations. Washington favored an attack on New York City. Rochambeau I said in the last video, he might make a video about Rochambeau because of what he did at Valley Forge. That was not Rochambeau. That was Baron von Steuben. Correcting it now. Which I'm sure him he probably could make a video on von Steuben. Because he lied his way into being a pretty good trainer of uh, soldiers. But back to this video. Who favored an attack on Cornwallis in Virginia. It was at this time information provided by the Marquis de Lafayette arrived. Lord Cornwallis was moving his troops to the tactically indefensible position at Yorktown, Virginia to either receive reinforcements or withdraw. Seizing the moment, Washington and the Comte immediately set out to Yorktown. Lafayette could only provide Washington with this war-winning intelligence because of the daring feats of one man. He was, at different times of his life, a slave and a slaveholder, a runaway, a courier, a guide, and ultimately a double agent for the Patriot cause. He was James Lafayette, and it's his story we are telling today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. He was born to any... Sorry, I was getting some candy. <laughs> okay. I don't know why I muted the mic, sorry. I was getting some candy, so back to the video. That's really nice. Belgrove Manor, Virginia Plantation must be where he was born. Enslaved mother in either 1748 or 1750, likely on the plantation of his enslaver, John Armistead, in New Kent County, Virginia. As was common practice, John would informally gift James to his son William, who was born in 1754. We're left in the dark about James's childhood and his early years. While he served William, the two likely formed a close bond. They were, after all, children who grew up together. James was even taught to read and write, likely alongside William. By 1779, John Armistead had died. In his will, William inherited his father's estate, including the slave, James. By then, the Revolutionary War had been raging for four years, and William, a fervent patriot, was serving as paymaster to Virginia's militia. James, due to his ability to read and write, likely helped William manage the affairs of the Virginian forces. 
when the now British General Benedict Arnold began raiding the Virginian countryside in 1781, James requested and received his master's permission to enlist in the Continental Army. Specifically, James requested to join the unit commanded by the Marquis de Lafayette. Initially, James was intended to be nothing more than a simple courier tasked to transport dispatches to and from Lafayette's headquarters. But as the two men quickly became good friends, Lafayette soon realized that James possessed the perfect skills and cover story to be a spy. The Marquis instructed James to present himself as a runaway slave at Arnold's camp and then offer his services to the British. There were three main reasons the Marquis believed James would be quickly accepted into the British ranks. First and foremost, the British forces needed someone familiar with the Virginian countryside to mm -hmm. guide them. James, having lived in the area his entire life, fit the bill exactly. Secondly, considering the Earl of Dunmore's proclamation that slaves who fought for the crown would be granted their freedom, it made perfect sense for a runaway slave to join the British. Finally, the alleged timing of James's escape was also logical. After Cornwallis's resounding victory at the Battle of Camden in August 1780, the British seemed to be on the cusp of total victory. For a slave, time appeared to be running out to join the British Army and win your freedom. James was at... Somebody help! Sorry. I'm eating some high chews candy. Have you ever had it? It's delicious. Back to the video. James was, as it turned out, a natural. He not only gained the trust of Arnold, who used him as a guide, but he also earned the full confidence of Lord Cornwallis himself. Nice. Lord Cornwallis had such faith in James that when the latter proposed he gather intelligence on the American forces nearby, Cornwallis agreed. This was a brilliant move on James's part, as his duties for the British meant he could travel freely right to the American lines without arousing any suspicion. If he was spotted speaking to a Continental officer, he could simply say he was gathering intelligence for the British. And so James, still enslaved, became a double agent for the American cause. Of course, the British underestimated him, much like the British sentries guarding the Hudson River underestimated Cato Howe. Whether due to blind trust or racial animus, British officers had no qualms about freely and openly discussing their strategic plans with James standing nearby. He was he was a he was a a former slave to them. There's no way if he's run to them and he says, I'm a, I'm a runaway slave, blah, blah, blah. There is no reason for them to think that a guy who just supposedly ran away is a double agent. If, if he's come to them and he said he's a runaway, chances are good, yeah, he's, he's a runaway. Because they got to think, why would he want... He's not going to be an agent, a double agent. Because that would mean that we could kill him as the British. Or they're going to kill him, the Americans. When they find out he was a double agent, they find out he ran away, his master could kill him. Or... Um, I forgot the third one. But anyways, yeah, they're, yeah they, they have no reason to believe that he's a double agent. As good as invisible. James constantly fed the Marquis accurate and detailed reports about British troop movements and strength while simultaneously providing false information to the British. While the British troops greatly outnumbered Lafayette, due to James's actions, Cornwallis thought he was outnumbered. Believing his position to be untenable, given James's seemingly valuable intelligence, Cornwallis opted to withdraw to a little seaside town named Yorktown on the Chesapeake and await either reinforcement or evacuation. James quickly informed the Marquis that Cornwallis and an army of 10,000 men were preparing to withdraw to Yorktown. 
understanding the strategic opportunity that had just presented itself, the Marquis immediately communicated this situation to General Washington. In response, General Washington and General Rochambeau, already planning a joint Franco-American operation against British forces, quickly marched their troops to Yorktown and engaged Cornwallis in a siege. While the combined American-French army trapped Cornwallis by land, the French Navy arrived and blocked any escape by sea. Cut off, surrounded, outgunned, and now outnumbered, defeat for Cornwallis was only a matter of time. It's impossible to overstate James's role in securing this war-winning victory. While the revolutionary leadership would have eventually received word Cornwallis was at Gorktown, it very well might have been too late. Yeah. Cornwallis surrendered on October 19th. The British Relief Force, a fleet under the command of Admiral Thomas Graves, arrived on the scene on October 24th, 1781. Learning that Yorktown had fallen, the Admiral withdrew back to New York. But what if Cornwallis was still able to hang on for just those five more days? Though the French had nine ships more than the British, Cornwallis's fleet at anchor consisted of over 20 supply ships, which would have been lightly armed, several warships, and shore batteries. If Cornwallis's ships sailed out to join the relief force in a battle against the French fleet, it is certainly possible that the French vessels would have either been destroyed or forced to withdraw. Who's to say the French fleet would have even been in position if not for James's information? Any of these alternate outcomes would have allowed for the successful evacuation of Cornwallis and his army back to New York to link up with General Clinton. If Cornwallis had been able to join Clinton in New York, who knows what could have happened? Mm -hmm. If Washington had left for Yorktown even two weeks later, would Clinton's army reinforced by Cornwallis, launch a counterattack in the north while Washington was moving to the south. Without the invalid... There's... Damn it. There are so many what-ifs to the Revolutionary War. So many. That it's almost ridiculous the amount that you could go Without over. the invalid... Well, what if this happens, and then what if that happens? Well, what if those two happened? And then this over here happens. I mean, that, that would cancel out that too. And it, There's so many what-ifs. It's, it's just ridiculous. And, and, and people can probably find what-ifs today. You find new ones. What if that one soldier didn't throw his gun seven feet to the right and instead turn ran with it to the left? Then that guy wouldn't have been able to pick it up. Which eventually led to killing so-and-so in a battle three weeks later. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can... It's weird intelligence provided by James, the war's entire outcome could have been different. America, as it is today, may not exist. After his service with Lafayette, James returned to his owner. He remained the property of William Armistead, a 1783 law passed by the Virginia State Assembly that gave enslaved people who had fought as soldiers their freedom did not apply to James. He was not a soldier, he was a spy. In 1784, the Marquis de Lafayette was deeply disturbed to discover that his friend was still enslaved. In a bid to help James win his freedom, the Marquis personally wrote to the Virginia State Assembly on his behalf. This is to certify that the bearer by the name of James <clears throat> has done essential services to me while I had the honor to command in this state. His intelligence from the enemy's camp were industriously collected and most faithfully delivered. He perfectly acquitted himself with some important commissions I gave him and appears to me entitled to every reward his situation can admit of. I just say this. Of all the people that James Armistead Lafayette could have been linked to, the Marquis de Lafayette was on that list of anti-slavery which is probably a, another reason why he he you know was able was willing to work with him and, and not just turn James away as a 
you know, a guy who's not joining the military for something. He just could have treated him as a runaway slave. And yeah, yeah, you're going to work in the camp. Lafayette was a different, I mean, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. Uh, I wish a lot of more of his th thinking on slavery and stuff like that could have rubbed off. I know he tried, but I wish it could have rubbed off better. And this, that generation could have handled it instead of as John Adams said you know we we dealt with the revolution it's the next generation's uh, um, desire or something something like that to to deal with slavery it's like come on John I understand what you're saying but let's let's not get into the habit of kicking things down the road because we the, the, you know the country did that and uh, so yeah let's let's handle it in the moment let's just get things done despite having one of the revolution's greatest heroes as a supporter the assembly did not even consider the issue oh. nearing the end of his i'm sorry the virginia state assembly can just uh, i was gonna say suck a bag of dicks but you know they can't term in the House of Delegates in the fall of 1786, William Armistead threw his weight behind James's second petition for freedom. Lafayette's letter was reintroduced. On Christmas Day, 1786, the House passed an act to grant James his freedom. The Virginian Senate confirmed the bill on January 1st, 1787. The governor of Virginia signed the legislation on January 7th, officially making James a free man. The bill also had a clause that provided William a $250 payment as adequate compensation for the loss of a valuable workman. It was wow. at this time James, who never used the- James didn't have to pay that, did he? Or was that the government paying that? He shouldn't have to pay that. The Armistead adopted Lafayette as his surname in honor of his former commander, benefactor, and friend. James, finally free, continued to live in New Kent County, becoming the owner of a 40-acre farm just a few miles away from the Armistead estate. While many sources claim he married and had several children, no existing records confirm this. Documents, however, do show that James owned at least three enslaved people who helped him run the farm. In 1818, in failing health, James petitioned the House of Delegates once again, asking for a small sum for immediate relief and such moderate pension for the remnant of his days as in your wisdom shall seem just. The legislature granted him a $60 one-time payment and an annual stipend of $40. During his grand tour of the United States in 1824, mm. while entering Richmond, Virginia, the Marquis instantly recognized the face of his friend in the crowd of people who turned out to greet him. Lafayette immediately ordered his carriage be brought to a halt. The 66-year-old man hastily dismounted and rushed through the bewildered crowd right to James. When he finally reached his old friend, he embraced him. When and where James Lafayette died is unknown. His year of death is usually reported as 1830 in Baltimore or 1832 in Virginia. There is no record of where he was laid to rest or what happened to his family. What then can be said of the man who, while enslaved, played a crucial role in helping form the nation where all men are created equal? He volunteered for service of his own volition, rather than being coerced into service by his master. We may never know whether he chose to join General Lafayette's unit simply because it was the closest one, or because of Lafayette's well-known anti-slavery views. Yeah. Despite never taking up a weapon, he risked his life every day for a nation that would not even grant him his freedom. After a lifetime of servitude, he chose to hold others in bondage when he was finally set free. 
Perhaps he held himself in higher esteem than other slaves. Yeah. After all, he could read and write, and he served as a spy proudly during the American Revolution. Surely he must have reasoned, as a free man, it was only natural he had slaves of his own. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. That was really good. Um, I knew the name. I got excited at the end. I was like, oh, oh, because I knew this story. And that is, is how I know the name then, James Armistead Lafayette. Armistead was because of that. Yeah. Rest in peace, bud. You did great. The British don't think so. Uh, descendants of Cornwallis probably don't like you very much, but uh, no, I think you did great. You're fantastic, buddy. Have a high chew on me. Candy I've been snacking on. Oh, it's so good. It's a... Uh, Hi, Chew. This is sweet and sour. They got a grape one. Oh. Just tastes like, um, I want to say Welch's grape juice, but Concord grapes. There you go. That's what it is. Okay. I'm done making videos for the night. It's Monday, June 5th. I did a, a short video today, a short uh, at the job I was at. So, I don't know when this will come out, but <laughs> you can go back and watch it. It was just the job I was at and what I was doing. I'll probably do another one tomorrow when I get done with it. Just a quick highlight of everything that I did. Okay. I think about doing a vlog. Just a couple times a week, three times a week. But, eh, probably just stick with the shorts. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to end this here. Apologize for all the useless speaking. Um, like and subscribe. And until next time, have a good day, have a good night.